Hi, this is Dr. Cairns with a conversation about leadership and the purpose-driven life. The purpose-driven life, influenced in part by Rick Warren's book of the same title. How much is purpose? How much is drive? How much is talent? Makes up the purpose-driven life. Rick Warren says the secret to effectiveness is to know what really counts and then do what really counts. Finding our passion and purpose in life is, is challenging, I'm sure, uh, for each one of us. We, we may find that sometimes matching our passion to the jobs that we have uh, is even more challenging or the careers uh, that we choose. However, when we, once we do find uh, our passion and our purpose and we do it, uh, then uh, we will know we're making a difference, which is really what we want to do is have meaning in the things that we're working for. It's not necessarily uh, only achieved in a nonprofit or a faith-based organization. It's also achieved in secular organizations. Real leaders are ordinary people with extraordinary determination. I like this quote for two reasons. One, because of what it says. And secondly, because it's anonymous. It just seems appropriate uh, that this statement would be attributed to someone we don't even know who said it. Just a real life example. So our drive is really what's going to take us forward. If it's important to us, we will accomplish it. How much is talent? Obviously, the better we're skilled, the more capable we are, the more success is likely to have. I call this one giving God something to work with. Uh, so if we have a dull axe, uh, we're going to uh, need more strength. But if I sharpen that axe, I will be able to wield it with much more skill. I have a list of individuals here. Most of them I think you'll recognize. Uh, perhaps maybe not John McKee, CEO of Whole Foods, Ray Kroc, founder of McDonald's. And I think probably the rest of the names uh, you recognize. They all share something in common. Yes, they're very visible and very successful people. Uh, I believe they've all had a purpose-driven life. But they also, from a talent standpoint, none of them have college degrees. However, they were able to hone their skills and achieve great accomplishments. So does that mean you should disenroll in this program? No. Uh, our skills can be uh, grown in a number of different ways. Uh, obviously through on-the-job type training and, and actually putting things into work. We can also learn from others and that's what we're doing in this educational program. So let me give you an example of a purpose-driven life and a little bit of the background that goes into it. I've chosen an individual that is very familiar to all of us and that's King David. And uh, But when I want to look at this is from the standpoint of uh, he wasn't always king. Most of us uh, are not born into royalty. How is it that we he got elevated to be a king? How is it that other individuals get elevated to be CEOs, congressmen, other visible individuals of prominence. Uh, how is that possible? And I, you have some examples, obviously, that I just gave you of individuals who have been able to accomplish uh, quite uh, a lot uh, without being born into royalty. So I think that serves as a good purpose for us. So let's look at King David just for a few moments. Background of the story is that Samuel, God tells him that I want to remove uh, Saul as king and uh, so I want you to go to the house of Jesse and anoint the next king he doesn't tell him who it is and so Jesse uh, has nine sons and in the uh, order of the way things would be uh, it would be natural for the firstborn son to be uh, the chosen one and so he brought him forth but Samuel recognized no that's not who God has and before you know it he goes through all eight sons and then uh, thinking, well, maybe I've come to the wrong place or I didn't hear God right. He said, do you have any more sons? He goes, yeah, I have one more son. He's out taking care of the sheep. And then Samuel, of course, sends for him. And then David comes and God confirms, yes, this is the one and anoint him. And so he does. So let's look for a couple moments. David is a very young man. He's just a, just a boy. And uh, what's, he, what's he doing? He's out tending to his father's flock. Well, his dad's a rancher or a farmer, and sheep are very much a part of their economy. And so, and they're also very valuable. 
So from that standpoint, he was taking care of his father's flock and it was important. He was being a good steward and accountable uh, for those sheep. Thus, uh, we find later, you know, where he went and rescued sheep and, uh, and made sure that he, he kept uh, account of all the sheep that his father had. And so you see some statistics here in terms of uh, it's worth $39 million to the U.S. economy and the U.S. is only uh, number 50 in terms of world sheep inventory ranking and uh, California is uh, one of the top uh, three states if not the top state for sheep uh, in the United States so a little bit of trivia for you but while he's out there he's also honing some other skills that will come into play later on uh, as we'll see not only is he skillful at uh, not losing sheep attending to them and taking care of them uh, but he's also learning how to do that and how's he doing that he's doing that with the one weapon that he had uh, which was a slingshot and I believe he was out there taking target practice he was actually shooting at prey birds that w birds of prey that would be coming uh, other uh, animals as well and became skillful uh, with that slingshot uh, why else did he select five stones when it came to uh, facing Goliath he knew that God was with him but he also was confident in his skill uh, with a, uh, a slingshot and also that the landing of that first shot I actually think God guided it uh, as well but uh, he put it in the general direction and knew where he was was heading so he had a lot of skill he also was the number nine son so in the pecking order of uh, of uh, importance he was the least important son uh, but yet he had extraordinary determination and desire uh, to serve God and to do what really counted so an anatomy of a purpose-driven life we can look at that and say well you know God is the one who plucked him off the desert to be king he saw something in him and he saw that he also was honing skills he wasn't wasting time while he was out there so with us in our life what I would say is work on your talent work on the things that are important to you from a passion standpoint and have determination and then let God do the anointing Psalm 23 is something we're very familiar with uh, David when he was anointed king it was would not be until 15 years later that he would actually uh, take the throne of the kingdom uh, from Saul and when Saul uh, died uh, in the in the battle and so we see this uh, psalm David wrote this psalm on the way back uh, it's believed going back to uh, tend to his father's flock after uh, the time with with Samuel and what we see here I want and I have bolded is he leads me and I think that's the most important aspect uh, that we need to consider when it comes to having a purpose-driven life is he leads me so what I'd like you to do now is to discuss the following questions assign a percentage to how much of a purpose-driven life do you think is purpose how much do you think is drive how much do you think is talent are they equally weighted are they distributed somehow differently explain your rationale and then is it necessary to be a person of faith to be successful is it necessary to be effective I showed you some individuals earlier on with a purpose-driven life so wrestle with that for a little bit and then what role should faith have in the workplace thank you for listening Engage in the topic and engage with one another.